Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Tiaming Liu. I had the great pleasure and honor of collaborating with Dr. Liu and visiting his lab at UGA, and that was a wonderful experience. Dr. Liu is a distinguished research professor and a full professor of computer science at the University of Georgia, UGA. Dr. Liu is also affiliated faculty with UGA Bioimaging Research Center, UGA Institute of Bioinformatics, and Institute of Artificial Intelligence. Dr. Liu's primary research interests are brain imaging, computational neuroscience, and brain-inspired artificial intelligence, and he has published over 380 papers in this area only. Dr. Liu is also a recipient of the several NIH and NSF career award, and he was a general chair of MICA in 2019. Dr. Liu, thank you very much for being here, and without further ado, I will let you take it from here. Thank you so much, Ami, uh, for your uh, invitation and the kind introduction. So it's a really great pleasure to be here to share my research in the recent uh, probably uh, 10 to 15 years. So let me uh, stop my video so it will be smooth and problem. Okay, so um, the title today is uh, Disentangle Human Brain Commonality and the Individuality. So this is a little bit a strange title, but I'm going to go through the whole uh, presentation and explain the major point of this uh, topic. So let's start with the cortical folding. This is my favorite research topic. I have been working on this topic for 20 years when I was a postdoc in Crystal Star Dickens Lab and the Dingan Sense Group in UK uh, about 20 years ago. So if you look at the folding of the brain, the cerebral cortex, quite smooth in animals like a rat and then become much more and more and more convoluted in like cat, sheep, chimpanzee, and human. If you look at the human brain's folding pattern, that's really complex and extremely variable. And we can look at the folding pattern from multiple scales, from a small patch like this. Typically, we can calculate the, uh, the uh, uh, curvature of this uh, small piece. And then we can look at a slightly larger piece, then we can fit a parametric model to this small piece and see what kind of patterns we can classify. And we can look at even larger neighborhood. To look at the called three hinge, we have uh, one, two, three gyri crest connect to one point, that, that's what we call three hinge gyri. Or you can look at the sulcus or gyrus which is a larger scale. So this is pretty much in the uh, current uh, wide application of brain atlas, like a broadman map, people use a gyrus and sulcus to, to, to delineate the brain. And most of brain atlas uh, are based on this kind of gyrus sulci uh, delineation brain. And then we can look at the whole lobe of the brain and look at the, look at the gyrification index of the whole lobe. That's very commonly used in uh, modeling folding patterns in a much larger scale. Or you can look at the whole brain, right? We can do like a, a spherical wave transform and look at the resolution, different resolutions or scales of the folding pattern. So this is a really complex problem. So let me show you the simplest uh, case of the folding pattern that is the inward sulcus and outward Gyrus. So this is the uh, basic unit, I would say, of the cerebral cortex, sulcus and gyrus. But it's really hard to understand, really, really uh, uh, complex uh, to understand the uh, folding process in gyrus and sulcus. What is the mechanism behind this uh, gyrification process? There are many theories, dozens of theories at the least. So, for example, one theory is, uh, was published in 1997 in Nature by Wayne, David Wayne, and probably most people read this paper before. And the hypothesis is that the axons connect to two sides of the brain, and they say called a pulling force that you can pull these two gyrus together, two for, uh, brain region together, then you form a gyrus and a sulcus. So you can see that called so-called tension force within these axons and the pull together. So you can see a lot of wiring diagrams 
and then to pull these two sides of this folding pattern together from the gyro sockets. And in 2012, in my group, we published another paper in cerebral cortex, which is the cover page of this journal. And on that issue, we have another completely different updated theory of this folding process. Our theory is this. The axons, fibers, they connect, most of them are densely connected to the gyrus, and they're going to pull this region into a gyrus, and the other right region will slide into a sulcus. So that is our kind of axon pull, pushing theory. Okay. So, and in the past 10 years, around 10 years, my group has been working very hard to either prove or disprove our theory or hypothesis, axon pulling or axon pushing. And this is a fundamental in terms of morphing the brain into very com complex, very convoluted, and very variable folding pattern. So we have to understand the original mechanism of cortical folding. Then we can understand the common patterns, the variable patterns, the commonality, and the individuality of the human brain in terms of structure, connection, and function. So that's why I'm so interested in the folding mechanism of the brain for so long time. OK, so let's look at our data. So this is a very typical diffusion tensor imaging data. And the difference is that we reconstruct the cortical surface from the detailed data. So we published this paper about 15 years ago. We do the tissue segmentation from detailed data. So we have white matter, gray matter, etc. So that we can reconstruct the cortical surface, the folding pattern from the diffusion tensor imaging data instead of MRI data. Because everybody knows that there's a distortion in detail EPI sequence, and the align, alignment of detail data and the MR data are not perfect. There's a lot of misalignment. So if we reconstruct cut surface from detail data, we can see the beautiful alignment of the end point of these axon fibers. They all follow the gyrile folding pattern. Okay, so that is our original observation. Most of the endpoint of the axon fibers follow the gyrification pattern. Okay. And then we do we did a lot of communication. For example, we measured the fiber density on gyra and salsa, and it looks like they are from three to five to even seven to eight times difference in terms of fiber density on the gyrus and sulcus. So that means most of the long distance axon fiber connections concentrated on gyra. So that's an uh, experiment result from the diffusion test imaging data of the human brain. Okay. Then we look at the chimpanzee brain on the right and the monkey brain on the left. We saw the same phenomenon. So that means most endpoint of fibers concentrated on gyrus, a lot on soccer. If you look at the distribution patterns. And the density difference is about five to seven to eight times. So it's a really significant difference. So then we look at the hard data because most previous slides I show you the diffusion tensor imaging data we can use say, and like 30 directions, we can use 20 directions, things like that. But if you look at the hard, the higher angular resolution diffusion imaging data, we have more better sensitivity in terms of fiber orientations and densities, we believe this is a better imaging modality in terms of diffusion and the connectivity imaging. So we saw the same phenomenon. We saw most of the fibers reconstructed from hardy data concentrated on gyrus. You can see the red area highly con densely connected by long distance axon fibers on the gyrus. So this is consistent is our previous DTI data of human brain, monkey brain, chimpanzee brain. Then we look at the human connectome project data. This data was probably one of the best quantity data in the human imaging field, right? Everybody use, pretty much everybody use HCP data. We saw the same phenomenon. If we map the fiber density after the uh, diffusion test image, because they actually use three shells, right? So the quantity is really high. And then we can see most of the fiber dense Fiber end point follow the gyro pattern and the concentrate and gyrus, not sockets. So this is the from the human connection project generated by the team in Washington, St. Louis, and David Manson is the PR of this project. Probably he saw this kind of phenomenon as well. 
in his HCP data. So this is widely used data. We very well reproduce the same test, the same, same observation, no matter one single shell, three shell, no matter how many diffusion directions, how the HCP, anything, we saw the same phenomenon. And then we look at the stalkers, why there's much less fiber connection on the stalkers. And then we found that a lot of called kind of U-shape. This is a widely reported U-shape fibers uh, causing around the sulcus. That is a sulcus fundus. You can see a lot of U-shapes. They are in parallel with this cortical cerebral cortex surface. They're not connected, but they are in parallel. So that's why a lot of fibers are concentrated and concentrated on gyrus, but the course around the sulcus. That explains why the much less fiber density, connected fiber density on the sulcus. So we categorized, visualized, and measured all these kind of U-shaped fibers uh, in the whole human brain, major sulcus. So that uh, explains the much less dense uh, fiber connection patterns in the sulcus. And then you may say this is a kind of a so-called gyro bias, gyro bias um, because the fibers, when you do the diffusion imaging, they're forced to connect to the end point of the, uh, the crest of gyrus. So we look at the uh, fetus brain. So this is a very high resolution fetus MI, uh, diffusion MI image. This data, I think, was acquired using 200 micron, so which is much higher resolution than the traditional DTI imaging. And this is a flat brain, like a fetus brain. It's not, not much gyrus yet. So there's no gyrus uh, wise at all. But we can see, we can see uh, a lot of fiber endpoint focus on the gyri crest. And a lot of U-shaped fibers coursing around the surface. So that means what we, we observed in the adult human brain with very convoluted gyrus salsa this results are reproduced in the fetus brain using very high resolution diffusion spectral imaging with very high resolution. There's no gyro price, there's no convolution, much convolution, but we see it, but we still see a lot of U-shaped fibers causing on sulcus. Most of the fiber density constitute on gyrus. So this is pretty much reproduced in all the data we have seen so far. And then we look at the developmental data, data, right? So the brain's developing. If we look at the zero, yes, yeah, so that means the baby is just born. We look at the, the, uh, the uh, new infant brain. We follow up them in one, zero year, one year, and two year. And this data was provided by UNC Chapel here. They have the, one of the largest the baby connection project going on. They shared the data with us and we caused the paper with them. We saw the same thing. We can see most of the fiber endpoint concentrate on gyra and three hinge gyra. And this is correlated with the cortex thickness. That means the gyrus is thicker than the sulcus and they have much denser fiber connection endpoint. And we can see this dynamically in the in the developmental trajectory. So this is also a support our previous hypothesis and theory in terms of fiber density is much higher on gyrus, not sulcus. So this is a completely imaging, different imaging center. They use different uh, protocols, different machines, different age. We saw the same thing. And then you may ask, DTI's resolution is limited. Yeah, we know that. So let's look at the histology data. So we, we did the experiment on the uh, dog brain and we did the histo histological staining. We can see the axons are really going in this direction in the gyrus, but the course around the sulcus in this direction in parallel with the cervical cortex surface. So this is a further evidence that what we observed in the DTI, DSI, HD, all kinds of imaging data, human, the microscope imaging data is consistent with the histology data. So we are more and more confident that this is a true balance, not uh, imaging artifact. So then to uh, either prove or disprove our hypothesis, we need the computation simulation modeling. So the conclusion is that if there is an axon fiber, 
or even Galil cell, you can see, uh, so because in the early developmental stages, a lot of Galil cells are uh, uh, radial direction in, in parallel with the axons. So if there's any support area like this, like axon, it's very likely there will be a gyrus coming out of this region. So that means if there's a dense fiber connection on the gyrus, it is sufficient to form a gyrus. So this is proved by our computational simulation and the model using finite element model. So this is another biophysical or biomechanical support to our hypothesis. So it's very likely higher density growing axons will form the gyrus. So this is called axon pushing theory. And then what is the functional consequence of this uh, brain architecture? We can see a lot of long distance axon fibers connecting gyrus on 2N and the much less connections on the sockets and the U-shaped fibers will cause around this uh, sockets. So we propose a functional model of the gyrus and saucer. Our model hypothesis that the gyrus regions are the global functional connection hubs and sockets are the local process unit. For example, you can look at this gyrus. Gyra regions are like Atlanta, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, big cities that have long distance connections with other big cities. But these sockets are the local process unit, the higher function process unit, like walking severe, like Athens, Northern Sevilla, Aparada, all connect to the bigger cities like Atlanta. So that is our hypothesis, a function model of the brain. So gyra and salsa are the two fundamentally two unit, distinct unit of the human brain, a cerebral cortex, gyra and salsa. Okay, so let me walk you through. We proposed this theory in 2013, about 10 years ago in Brain Structure Function Journal. Then we are going to look into the details of this functional model, why this is the case, how it works. So we uh, divide the brain into gyro and salsa and pick up all the functional signals, the gray alternate signal in the HCP human connected project data, very high resolution data, two millimeter isotropic function data. And we look at the convolutional neural networks and we classify the gyro and salsa FMI signals by this convolutional uh, neural network. And we can see that we can have a very decent classification accuracy. That means Gyra FMI signals and the south side FMI signals are quite different. If we look at the filters that account for this classification, we can see a lot of low frequency, lower frequency filters are contributing to the gyrus, and the high frequency filters contributing to the sulcus. So that means the gyrus region are doing more fundamental, lower frequency functional connectivity, functional works. And the sulcus are doing more higher frequency, higher order functional works in a localized fashion. So that is the data-driven approach. We uh, published this paper in 2018 in several Cortex. Um, then we keep Moving forward, so what is the fundamental mechanism? Why the brain is divided in gyro and salsa? Their structure different, function different, connection different. What is the fundamental reason? So we look at the molecular evidence. So we look at the kind of mammal set, the whole brain gene expression data. In this data set, uh, it was released by, by the Recon Brain Institute in Japan. They did uh, 2,000 genes and the measured gene expression using ISH in such a hybridization in the whole brain. So we can look at all pixel level gene expressions for 2,000 genes in each box of the brain. And then we pick up the gene expression pattern or transcription patterns in the gyrus and the sulcus. And it turns out that the huge difference between gene expression patterns in gyrus and sulcus. And many of these genes are related to the axon guidance in the brain development. For example, axon outgrowth, axon repulsion, and axon attraction. Then we have posited that some of the genes are morpho genes. They are differentially expressed in gyrus and saucers. For example, those of the axon attraction morpho genes that are expressed in, axon, in the gyrus, they're going to attract the axons to connect to gyrus. That explains why gyrus is much more 
much higher dense connections in the brain. And a lot of uh, axon repulsion uh, morphogens are expressed on the socket. They kind of uh, pull the axons away from the socket so they are pulsing around in parallel with the socket. So that is the molecular evidence in terms of transcription. So in terms of axon task finding morphogenes or axon guidance genes. So I think this is really a uh, molecular support to our general hypothesis of why the brain is divided into two fundamentally different units of gyro and sauce because the morphogenes, they are expressed. They decided the overall architecture in the brain in the right the beginning before the, even the development of the brain in the early, very early developmental stage of the brain. The morphogenes set up the architecture clues and the brain just follow that pattern and divide it into cells. Okay, so um, so that's the molecular bio biomechanical functional imaging computational support of our overall hypothesis. So the many things to do in the future, um, we only did fMRI data in the future. We hope we can do EEG data or ecology data in the uh, animal models, not just mouse. We hope we can do monkey, we can do mammal set so that we can look at the really real time millimeter second, millisecond resolution of the uh, recordings and neurophysiology recording in gyro and salsa. We really want to understand how they communicate in gyro and salsa. We also we want to look at the gene expression data, transcription data in the development brain, in the monkey, in the monkey, in the uh, uh, in the chimpanzee, and in the mouse. So we can look at the whole transcriptome, not just the specific axon guiding genes. We want to look at the neuron growth genes. We want to look at neuron migration genes, all kind of related genes. Look at the whole genome and explain why the brain is developing child and salsa and how the functional and the structure are different in terms of this kind of uh, uh, structure. So um, we have been working on this problem for over 10 years. We have a lot of things to do. We uh, a lot of questions that are a lot answered. So we will keep working on this direction. Any questions so far before I move forward to the next topic? There is one question uh, from, from uh, Kish Trishan. I hope I was spelling correctly. Yeah. He was asking if we can check and confirm this by doing autopsy on individual or like using electric microscopic. I think you had this slide on that. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, we did the experiment on histology using the uh, axon staining on, on individual uh, dark brains. Yes, we, we did that. Thank you. Of course, we should do better, do more. And there is another question from Hamid here. They're asking, how does this concord with the theory of learning in the brain? Theory of what? Can you say one more time? So they're asking, like, how is this concord with the theory of the learning in the brain? I'm not oh, quite yeah. sure. Hmm. Yes, that's right. So I think we are going to look at the uh, the stain, neural stainings in the uh, animal brain atlas. So unfortunately, we only have the mouse brain data. We don't have the, we have a little bit of monkey data. So uh, we are now working on the, uh, the NIH brain initiative, new data, the uh, cell consensus network data. So we are close to a conclusion very soon. We are working on that data set right now. Yeah. Okay, so more questions start coming. He uh, is asking, uh, He's stating that, uh, or he, that histology shows axon and fiber density, but is there a way to specifically show the endpoint density or not in this stuff? Yeah, that's a great point. So that's why we want to look at the developmental trajectories. So we are going to trace the end point of the axon. That's a great question, actually. So we hope we can use the optical imaging to really monitor the dynamics of the axon past finding. Yes, that's extremely hard as well. So we don't have the result yet. So that's why we only use the computation simulations to do that. So we hope we can sometime we can have maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of axon endpoint and look how they connect to the cortex and do the 
biophysics dynamics. That's great question. We are absolutely uh, interested in that experiment. True, true. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that's the first part of my talk. Uh, let me uh, jump to the second topic of uh, the uh, commonality and the individuality of the brain. So, you know, many people pretty much Everybody use the uh, Broadman atmos, no matter your basic neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience, or clinical neuroscience. And then, if you look at this specific brain map in any gyrus or sockets, you can see this much more detailed map if you look at the motor cortex. So, you know, if you look at the global scale gyrus sockets, pretty much common, pretty much uh, everybody has the same uh, layout. But if you look at the individual, more detailed mapping, the individual, the variation much, much more. So if you look at the two brains on the left side, the right side, if you look at the red region, we can see this brain folding like this, another brain folding like this. The question is, if you look at the brain image and registration field, how are we going to register them that together? How are we going to map them together? Which point is corresponding to which point? This is extremely hard problem. My 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 career started uh, with a brain image registration 20 years ago in Crystal and Dingang's group uh, in UK. And Crystal and Dingang have been working on this brain image registration for 25 years already. So we we really don't know what is the best match between this kind of very variable pattern. Then instead of look at this very hard question, we kind of uh, look at a simpler question. How about we design some net, define some landmarks or define some uh, region of interest in the brain? We want to see if there's a common pattern or uh, there's a function or structure corresponding between these landmarks in the brain. So let's simplify this pattern a little bit. So then we decide, decide to look at the called region of interest landmark definition in three cortex. Here's the problem. If you move the region of interest of landmark a little bit to left or right, for example, to the green, to the red ball, uh, ball, just a little bit, the structure connectivity patterns are completely different. Or if you increase the size of this bubble of this region, the connectivity patterns are also completely different. So it's really hard to define any landmark in brain in terms of its size, its location, and its shape. Okay, so we're going to deal with this problem first. And in 2010, we uh, published paper in NIPS um, with the computational, uh, uh, computational artificial intelligence conference. In this paper, we for, for the first time showed that if we look at the precuneus, which is a red region in three brains, this precuneus is activated by a working memory task FMI. We have expert many to annotate this three precuneus in three different, brain, different brains. We can see that the folding pads are completely different, right? We cannot locate, localize this three precuneus by folding pads. There's no way to do that. Of course, we can use that using FMI to do that. And if we trace all the fiber connections to these three precuneus regions on the bottom, we can see the fiber connectivity patterns are very similar in the global sense. So that means Consistent structure connectivity pattern in different brains can predict the same function in different brains. That is the hypothesis. So let me see one more time. Consistent structure connection patterns in different brains can determine or predict function. That's very important hypothesis. And we showed that in three brains in the working memory FMA data, we act to the same function region and we see that very similar connective patterns. So, inspired by this finding in 2010, we asked this fundamental question, how many landmarks or how many regions of interest in the human brain cerebral cortex that show consistent structure connectivity patterns across all human brains? I mean, all human brains, not just one, just 10, 100, all human brains. We don't know. So, we start with 2,000 bubbles randomly placed on the grid point of the brain in the 3D space. Then we define the brain uh, called the trace map structure. We are going to model this uh, the connect structure connective pattern and then project all the fibers onto a unit sphere. 
we call the trace map. Then we can do the optimization of this trace map across different groups. And it turns out that out of projection optimization, we can come up with something like this. So if we have two corresponding or very similar brain region on the A and B, if the show similar global 3D shape fiber connected pattern, they also show similar trace map features. On the right, if we look at C and D, they have a different pattern from A and B, but they have similar pattern on the trace map. So we kind of project a 3D fiber bundles into a unit sphere in the 2D space, space so that we can do the quantitative measurement and the comparisons. Then we can search the whole space in all human brains, in all landmarks. And this is the result we came up with. So we found that 358 regions or region of interest or landmarks, for example, the blue one, the yellow one, the red one, the pink one, and the purple one. And if you look at the pink one, we, if we look at the 10 brains on the left, another 10 brains on the right, they see, we see very similar structure connection patterns after the optimization of tracing map. So we move the bubble around in all these 10 brains in terms of size, shape, and location, we can find very consistent patterns. Okay, we did that for all human brains, all the landmarks. And then we can find this type of hundreds of brain regions, landmark across all human cellular cortex. We find 358 such landmarks that have very consistent patterns across all human brains. Let me show you this movie, this animation, you can have a sense how similar they are. So then we, come up with them called a die called dense individualized and a common connectivity based cortical landmarks. They are individualized because they are defined in each individual brain's own space. They have different folding patterns, they have different location, but they have very common and consistent connectivity patterns on these landmarks. And then we use this structure connective pattern, consistent structure connective pattern to define brain landmarks instead of using protein pattern. And we can find hundreds of them across all human brains, okay? And then your question will be, so what's the function roles of these hundreds of bubbles, of hundreds of brain landmarks? Then we use function might do to do the validation. This was about 10 years ago. We collect a line FMI data set, including eight task FMI, such as working memory, language, region, motor, all kinds of, available task FMI and one resident state FMI. And we can see that the activation, consistent group wise consistent activation locations are very co-localized closely with those DICO landmarks. So that means those DICO landmarks have function meanings. And they are quite reproducible. For example, this is a very, uh, very well known default mode network. We can see those DICO landmarks are very consistent and co-localized with the activation peaks or functional regions in the default mode network. And this is reproducible in two sessions, two scan sessions of same brain and in different brains. So that means consistent structure con connectivity can really co-localize, can predict functional regions, for example, the default mode network. Okay, so that's why we say the type based landmark representation can be a universal functional brain representation of the brain architecture. So you can do FMI into your data set, but we can use the DICO system to localize hundreds of regions in your data set and they, are, they have intrinsic correspondence in our model space. So we can use the DICO to connect all the functional activation patterns in all human brains, all tasks. So we can functionally annotate or label the same uniform, the universal brain function space. So that's what we did about 10 years ago. So let's look at the advantage of DICO. So traditionally we used like brain region, like a gyra, sulcus, like a broadman area, like AAL atlas, like MGH atlas, FS atlas. You can have hundreds of brain atlas, but they're all in the gyrus and sulcus resolution. So if we look at the connector, defined by this gyrus scale connecting one bubble, one region represent one gyrus. If you do the structure connectivity and function connectivity, you need to average all the FM signals on this gyrus 
and the fund measure the conductivity. So that's what we do for 10 years or 20 years already. If you look at the bike on the right, we can kind of divide the same gyrus, like a pre-central gyrus, into dozens of dike regions. You can divide the posterior central gyrus into another dozens of brain regions in dike. So you can see the connective pattern is divided into many, many more interactions, function, functional connectives in the dike representation space instead of rod main areas. Okay, so that means we can have a much finer gray functional definition. We can have a much finer gray connectivity pattern. We can have one magnitude higher of accuracy in terms of structure and the function and localization in the human brain. Okay, so that's what we did about 10 years ago. Um, so that's all I have to say about the type. Any questions so far before I jump to a different topic? So there are two questions regarding salsa and gyri. Uh, mm -hmm. One of them was uh, that if uh, you can, so have you considered the density of the, uh, have, have you considered density of the connectivity bundles with the level of skill or mind quickness? Right, so the scale of connectivity, we, so if we define the red region on the left, we average all the FM signal, or you, you integrate all the fiber connection to this region, right? If we divide the same region into dozens of brain regions, we just look at all the fiber connections in this smaller, much smaller region of interest or landmark. So we calculate the fiber connectivity connection to that specific landmark. So all depends on how you define the node of the graph, right? So if you have a larger node, you have more connections, uh, fiber connection that node, you have a smaller node, you have much less number of fibers to that connection. So that's what we do. The other question is from me, how varied these dicoles are across like subjects? So you identify a given dicole, how much the coordinate different varies? Yeah. So. The, the coordinates, so it's about a couple of pixels in the standard space. Um, I would say, yeah, so depends on the location of, of course, if on the, on the three hinge, you have more work source on the, on the socks, you may have less number of work source. So we have the same type of uh, for landmark so far. I would say dozens of work source in the standard space, in the template space, for example, AL or MGH standard space. That, that's the size. Yeah. There are like a, so many questions. If you don't mind, we can keep it at the end because I'm worried for your time. Okay, sure. Yeah. So um, let me jump to the next topic, which is called a three hinge gyra. I work a lot of uh, research effort right now on the three hinge gyra or gyra power, they call the uh, gyra net. So let me define what is three hinge gyra. So if you look at any yellow bubble, this yellow bubble is connected to three gyra crests. For example, one, two, three. If you can look at it, if you can see my mouse movement. So on the left is a monkey, in the middle is a chimpanzee, on the right is human. You can see the human brain have around 300 to 350 these yellow bubbles. This is called a three hinge gyra, connected to three gyra crests. And then this is the first paper in 2016. We defined this kind of anatomy in the whole uh, brain imaging sphere. So we defined this called three hinge gyro concept in 2016, about six years ago. And then if we look at the distribution of this hinge gyro on the monkey brain on the left, somebody in the middle, and the human brain on the right, you can see some of the three hinge gyro, like the six uh, circles showing you that these three hinge gyrus are very consistent across all human brains we examined so far. And these three hinge gyrus also consist across different species, like monkey, chimpanzee, human. So that means there will be some of the three hinge gyrus they are really the fundamental um, landmark or uh, fundamental pillars of the brain architecture. They're always there, no matter what is speech, no matter what is the developmental stage, no matter who you are. So that is good news for the common patterns in all human brains. But there are also many other three hinge gyra that are really con really variable. Let me jump, uh, let me go uh, jump, um, let me uh, jump the, uh, to the conclusion. Let me skip some of the details, how we can map this. There's a lot of details 
about how we're going to manage this three hit gyra. I'm not going to talk any of the details. So let me tell you the conclusion first. If you look at two brains on the left, another brain on the right, on the left, you can see the red bubbles are the three hinges, and the black curves are the two hinge gyra crest. So we represent the whole human cerebral cortex by these red bubbles and the red curves, which is called a gyra net. And the node on the three hinge are the gyra net graph node, and the edges are the black curves. So, and you can see in these two different brains, the number of three hinge gyra could be from 250 to 350 to 400. Each brain, each individual brain, they have different number of hinges, they have different uh, location of three hinges, they have different connectivity patterns. So the whole, in any individual brain is completely different. Okay, so that is conclusion. But the good news is, let me jump, uh, let me skip some of the details. The good news is that they are also very consistent three hinge gyrus across all human brains, across all developmental and aging stages. Let me show you a few of these very consistent gyrus, three hinge gyrus. So here I'm showing you the gyro net in one month, 48 months, 28 years, 66 years, autism and autonomy disease. We look at six populations. We can find the same set of six three hinge gyri on the left brain and across all individual brains, we accept. That means those three hinges are really the common pattern. They define the regularity of the human brain architecture across all human brains, no matter what the disease, no matter what the development stage. And then if we look at the brain development in more detail, you can see in the uh, fetus brain stage, when the brain is only 21 weeks, you can see some of the three hinges, you can see the red bubbles, they're all consistent across all developmental stages from fetus stage 21 weeks all the way to 24 months after the birth. But for some of the three hinge gyrus, if you look at the uh, fetus stage, some of the uh, blue bubbles, if you look at the blue bubbles, they're all dynamic, they're all variable across different developmental stages. So that means we need map all these red bubbles that define the consistent, the common three hinge gyrus on the gyro net and all the variable blue bubbles across all the environmental states. Then after the brain is developed, for example, in the childhood, in the adolescent stage, the number of three hinges will be stable. They will be correspondent to others in, in a very stable fashion. So we can reliably match all them. So, our fundamental role today, the our ongoing project is to differentiate all these common three hinge gyrus and those variable three hinge gyrus in individual space in a developmental trajectory. We are going to do that. So we know which gyrus are consistent, common, which three hinge are not uh, in the individual space. Then we will be able to tell you what are the common brain architecture and what is the individual brain architecture from fundamental neurodevelopmental perspective. We are going to tell you that in probably in a few years. So we are working on that. Another one is the uh, fundamental theory of cortical folding. Then jump to the first topic. Already mentioned the axon pushing theory. We know that the gyrus are connected by much denser axon fibers. And if you look at three hinge, look at the three hinge, their fiber connection density is even much higher. So, for example, three to five times higher than the regular two hinge gyro crest. So that means most of the three hinge gyro are connected by much denser axon fibers, and they are pushed by those fibers. And then we did the simulation. If there is a fiber density, higher fiber density, you are guaranteed to generate three hinge gyro. So that's why this is another strong support to our axon pushing theory. The three hinge gyrus are formed by very dense fiber connections. You have to have a five very dense fiber connection before you can have a three hinge gyrus. We know that the human brain have 100, 300, 400 three hinge gyrus. Then those gyrus are very highly densely connected by axon fibers. Okay, so that's the simulation result. And we are doing all kinds of simulation right now. So we hope we can parameterize the whole cortical folding architecture by hundreds of three hinge gyrus and by our gyro net. And then we can simulate. Once we can simulate the whole process, we know what are the fundamental 
determinant of this variability, what are the fundamental determinant of the recognition of brain architecture? So we were going to answer this question by computational simulations. Okay, because imaging data is so hard to get. So we work with the UNC Chapel here, they have the largest connection for brain development data set, but we only have a dozen of them. Okay, so that's not sufficient. So that's why we work on the computational simulations. We are going to answer this question by modeling and simulation. So the next, the last topic I'm going to talk a little, a little bit more is about the functional roles of these hinges, these dico landmarks altogether. So if you look at this dico landmarks, the second generation dico and three hinge uh, gyrus, we now have around 1,000 landmarks that are consistent across all human brains. 1,000, which is kind of one magnet higher than the broader area by the 100 brain region, fascination brain. And we now we have 1,000. So the next one, what are the function roles of this of this uh, landmark? Of course, we work on FMI data, we look at the resonance state, we look at the, the task FMI, we use the HCV, all kind of available data in the literature to function and animate all these landmarks, cycle landmarks, street landmarks, and the giant landmark. So this is another ongoing project. We have we have so many work to do to really understand the relationship between structure and function and the, the, uh, how do we come to uh, determine the function roles based on structure or go back based on the function of networks and function activity, how we can define the structure of networks and the connectivity. So a lot of things going on um, uh, at this moment. So this is the end of my talk. I would like to thank all kinds of NIH, NSF, and DOD support and all my collaborators, students, and regional scholars. So that's the end of my talk and have to answer your question. Thank you. Let me unmute Karim, Hamid Karim uh, before I forget uh, to ask your question. Hamid, would you like to ask your question? Yes, uh, I actually, uh, my question had to do with uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the common connectivity that you established among different brains, although perhaps uh, slightly different, uh, you know, slightly different uh, regions. What I was wondering, have you, have you looked at or considered the density? Some of those connect connectivities were of different densities. However, in terms of the uh, the density of the the uh, the bundles, the fiber bundles, mm -hmm. right? Uh, have you considered that as a function of maybe what if it, if it's an activity, a level of skills or level of quickness? You know, uh, quote unquote, perhaps slash intelligence or something have you looked at that yeah i think that's a great question so um how to define the brain load at the different scales right it's a really in interesting uh, question so one um approach we are working on right now is this so if we look at the left we can look at the scale at the gyrosocket scale or on the right individual node scale or we can group this node into subunit or motifs so we need much more effort to really investigate what will be the best scale of brain regions or landmarks to define brain connectivity. So what is scale we have to find the common pattern, what scale can define individual pattern. So I think that a lot of more work to be done to answer your question. So I think we, we need more effort, so. Thank you, great work, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, another question uh, is, uh, what are the, uh, the blue gyri that vary highly across individual? Can you tell some uh, tell us something about them? Like those that are more uh, vary across individual. Right, so the variability is very huge. So let me show you this uh, example. So if you look at the left brain, this posterior center is supporting like this, there's a curve here, another one is just going straight. So in terms of shape, it's extremely variable, right? And also, if you look at the uh, three hinge uh, gyro net, let me show you the gyro net, it's extremely uh, variable. So I think it really is a really daunting task to define the common patterns and the variable patterns. So that's what we are doing right now. So it's really hard to tell at this moment. So another question, I'm not sure if I understood correctly. Daniel, let me know if you want me to unmute you. So does the temperature play a role in gyro versus cell site density? And one would assume high frequency oxygen firing would uh, generate more heat. 
So it's basically asking my understanding is if there's any temperature difference between these two. Can, can you say it again? What's the, the major point of this uh, question? I, 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 so I, I'm, I think that the main question is they're asking like if there's any temperature difference. Uh, I'm not quite sure. Uh, Daniel, Compression difference? You... Compression? Temperature. temperature. Compression, okay. So Daniel, if you like, let me to unmute to ask you a question. This other question from Cyrus is asking, uh, does the imaging resolution matters uh, when you are estimating DICO? Like, is it easier to identify them in higher resolution or not? Yeah, uh, I, I believe a higher resolution, the higher resolution, the better, absolutely. So um, in the early stage of DICO, we use the uh, three millimeter, four millimeter actual traffic images. So right now we are using the actual one millimeter as a chubby is we can get up similar result of course you know you know you know diffusion testing resolution makes a lot of contribution another related issue is the fiber tracking you know we did an, a comparison between the fiber tracking with ground truth in the axon tracing data in mouse brain around the 20 to 30 percent of fibers are false positive so this is another major problem in the diffusion imaging field so the fiber track is not reliable at all. We make a lot of fast parts. The good news is that if they say same fast part in all human brains, our diagnosis can pick up that as well. So the better resolution, the better fiber track algorithm, the better the diagnosis will be. So we do not re rely on any specific protocol, image protocol to fiber tracking, but we only work on the trace, the trace map or the trajectories. So we we just do the post process and the fiber tracking uh, result. So, so the follow up question, which I think you already answered, is uh, how different brain normalization method uh, can uh, influence the dark estimation, or like is there any difference between 3D space or the flatten? I would say we have to do in this region 3D space. If you flatten in the uniform space, a lot of variability. We are be lost, I would say. Yeah. So that's the completely different strategy when we do the original gyrus net space, as you see on the screen, instead of the sphere, spheric space. That's that's not ideal because a lot of geometric information is lost after the inflation of the brain surface. And we do not do that. Of course, we can do that, but we don't do that because we need original space. We need original geometric 3D models, not the 2D models. So the other question is, there is a, you mentioned there is a difference between salsa and gyra, about like one of them is long uh, distance connection and short distance. Uh, are you seeing these in the functional connectivity map too? Like if you measure connectivity between those salsa and gyra or between them, do you see? Yes, yes, you see, we, that will be another completely different talk. <laughs> we, we, we have dozens of publications on that. Here, I only show you this very simple, uh, model over here let me show you the model here yeah this is a working model we have dozens of publications mm -hmm. on the function difference between gyro saucer not just the fmi that we did a lot of other stuff so in the regional in the global we use uh uh, uh traditional dictionary learning fmi data analysis we use all kind of deep learning fmi data set that's another completely different uh, talk i believe yeah a lot of study already published in my group yeah there's another question i think it needs a lot of time is like uh, uh, how that 3d you calculate those 3d in gyri mm. and i don't know if there is a brief explanation or if you want to explain uh, what about those TD gyre, 3D hinge gyres that you were calculating. Right. Oh, yeah, I skipped some of the details. Right, Let me right. go through the pipeline, okay? Uh, here is the pipeline. So we start with the quality surface reconstruction. We uh, extract the crest line skeleton by kind of distance trans transformation on the surface, on the manifold. Then we find the gyre joint by an another algorithm so we can map all the joint then we connect so to do that we have like technical gradient attitude second crest and extract uh, skeleton all kind of details and then we end up with the gyro crest um, uh, curves like a gyro net which is the red bubbles and the black curves okay so this paper was published in uh, 2017 by one of my PhD students so thank you
Uh, I would ask one more question, then we can wrap up if you don't mind. And sure. that's more like, uh, first, what is the future prospect of uh, for Connectomic? What's the future for Connectomic? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say definitely we need to go to higher resolution, not the broad area anymore. <laughs> we cannot just look at the brain using 100 regions. It's like you, 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 if you do GPS, say United States, we have 50 states. When I want to go to Georgia from Georgia to Atlanta, no, to North Carolina, I just won't pick. go from Georgia to, to North Carolina. We need like Atlanta essence at the street level so that we can really do meaningful connectomics and meaningful GPS. So I think this is absolutely the most, one of the most important thing for us to go really good fascination of the brain, good definition of the common structures. We do not do group wise the statistics other than that because we need to face individual brains. I give you an individual brain, they have, this brain has a completely folding pattern. How are you going to define the node on this brain? We, we can do image registration, we can do that, but the accuracy, I will tell you, it's about a 10 millimeter accuracy. The, 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 the kind of the uh, the uh, I would say the uh, error is about a 10 millimeter uh, on average across all human brains. We need a better, better approach to do the brain fascination in in the regionalist fashion, not the group brains. So that's absolutely one of the most important thing I would say for the future connectomic research. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time, Dr. Liu. And I apologize for those that I missed the questions. Uh, I will copy paste them in the Slack channel so we can follow up. Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Again, I hope you have a wonderful Friday and enjoy your weekend. You too. Thanks. Bye.